Hi, my name is Seb, and today I'm talking about At Night All Blood Is Black, which I got when I came to Ireland. Um, I rarely buy books, but look at this. Got this baby for two euros. Not bad. And, and considering it was 2021, which is the same year that it won the International uh, Booker Prize, you know, like to, to find it that cheap straight away, I thought it was just such a great deal. Um, and it was in a charity shop and everything. So I was just like, yeah, I'll go for it. Why not? Um, and yeah, when, so yeah, this is one of the only books I bought last year. Maybe the only book I bought last year, and it was worth it. It was uh, it was such a well. It's like it's like a bad dream. It's like when you're reading it, you're, it feels like you're struggling to wake up from a bad dream. And it's got this sort of like uh, feverish quality to it with all these repetitions. It's dizzying. It's uh, lurching from these moral justifications which are built on paradoxes which lead to uncertainty and it's all told in this like kind of frantic first person um, which reminds me of like Edgar Allan Poe or something. It's full of contempt, full of uh, anger, full of this Achilles like rage which I'm gonna get more into later. It almost feels like chanting in some places like that the, the, the prose becomes hypnotic to read you know it's, it gives you this whoa kind of like um, like you're reading a mantra or something. It's got the this, this sort of rhythm to it, which just keeps you going and going while, while feeling more and more dismal um, and grotesque as well, which is, you know, like it's really, uh, it's really exhausting stuff, but like in the best way possible. And it's like a slim little book, right? Um, I do have some issues with it, but I'm going to get into those more at the end. Let's start, first of all, with the uh, the plot summary. So the premise is great as well, which is one of the reasons I wanted to read it. It's uh, World War I. Um, it's the, we have a soldier who is fighting for France from Senegal, I think. He's from West Africa anyways. Um, and he, uh, he's, he's more than brother, he's called. So like his, his best friend, but who's like, he's got an incredibly strong and passionate link to this guy, um, is killed on the battlefield. And this guy's, you know, he's cut and his guts are coming out. And he's like, there's no way he's going to survive. But he's, he's in pain. He's in agony. And he asks this, this best friend of his to, uh, to put him out of his misery and, and just kill him, you know. And our protagonist, who's called, what's he called again? Gosh, I don't remember his name. Alpha. So Alpha um, doesn't know what to do. He's overwhelmed and he, he can't uh, he can't do it. He can't kill his best friend. So he stays with him instead until eventually, after a long time, his friend dies. Then afterwards, he feels incredibly guilty that he wasn't able to do this for his friend. Um, and the, the novel begins afterwards. So he's already kind of gone through this incredibly dark, traumatic event. And he's come out the other side, um, not the same person as he was, we're led to believe, uh, quite unhinged. And so what he starts to do when he's out in no man's land, did I mention it's World War One? Yeah, it's World War One, trench warfare and stuff, right? Um, but when he's in no man's land, he's, he goes finding enemy soldiers and cutting off their hands, like one hand, and bringing back a hand as a, as a sort of a trophy. And at first, he's kind of like lauded as a hero. It's like, wow, what an amazing guy. And then gradually, um, the people, the other, his fellow soldiers on his side, start to change their impressions of him. So that's the premise. That all happens at the very beginning of the book. As you can imagine, it's a very dark book. And I'm like, I'm not normally drawn to books about war. I think I've said this before, kind of recently. <laughs> um, but this is the second one I've read this year uh, because there's something about it that really uh, grabbed me with the premise. Um, and also, like, I've kind of got this weird unofficial tradition now of reading the winners of the International Booker Prize um, because, like, by chance I, I read a few and there's only it, it's only been around for a short amount of time. So I thought, yeah, like, why not just read them all? And, um, and yeah, this one this year, so I was, and, and it sounded great. So, yeah. Anyway, um, back to the book. Yeah, so it's, it's about war, it's about uh, race, it's about colonialism, it's about masculinity. These themes are very, like, kind of themey. They're, like, stuck together. You know, you can't really disentangle one from the other. Um, it feels like, in some ways, a very 21st century uh, interrogation of identity. You know, like, who is he, like, who is this guy Alpha um, in terms of these big historical identities about, um, you know, like to do with the, the war and to do with, uh, like, the way black people were treated then um, and, and the way that men are, you know, like masculinity, uh, all these sorts of expectations that are put on people from the outside. Um, it's, it's uh, how does that make who you are as a person? I felt that was like a very 21st century thing, which was very much uh, like kind of present through this, like as a, as a through 
as a thread. Another thing is morality, like uh, moral choices in war. Like, well, how do you make moral choices in war? That's a, that's a big one in this. Um, and as, as you can kind of tell from the from the opening thing about um, him not being able to kill his, his best friend who's begging to be killed. Another example is the way that Alpha belongs to this regiment of West Africans in the, in the French army. And they're basically, they're encouraged to perform their blackness um, in a way which fits the racist stereotypes of the time, as in like tribalistic and savage, um, and they're they're sent forward like they men they scream and they howl and um, it gives them like this kind of image which is used by the French to sort of terrify the enemies, um, and he just goes along with it uh, originally, but then after this traumatic, tragic event which happens, he starts to see things differently, like as an outsider, and he starts to see these identities uh, for what they are, which is like entirely performative, just performance to, you know, entrench certain stereotypes and, you know, make the most of stereotypes uh, for the war effort for these, you know, these white people who colonized them in the first place. And so he's kind of like, he's had a, he's had one of those through the looking glass moments, basically, where he's, he feels like he sees everything more clearly now. Um, than he did before. And then there's the ironic thing, which is um, because he sees things more clearly, his actions now seem to be those of a mad person to everybody else. Um, but also kind of to us with the whole hand chopping thing, right? It's like he considers them kind of crazy and himself free uh, from these, these constraining identities. Um, whereas to them, he's sort of like, you know, increasingly unhinged and, and kind of to us as well. Like, yeah, like the, it, it's like, it's asking us the questions, who's crazier the crazy person who thinks that war is crazy or the normal person who thinks that war is normal right um those kind of things are constantly uh being like brought up to the surface so it's it's kind of like oppressive it's a very oppressive little book which is great i, I love that it feels kind of french like very french to me like i don't know he's the the writer david diop is uh french senegalese i think um and like i don't know any senegalese literature unfortunately so maybe there's also like a lot of that in here um it definitely you know draws on a lot of the the background of, of alpha is coming from um i forget if it's senegal specifically but like at least west africa um but but yeah the french stuff like i don't know it's like the way the repetitions are used um in a sort of like artistic or poetic way so things are repeated not to like emphasize them so much but to create this kind of sense of ambiguity. The words I know, I understand are repeated all the way through and the word God's truth are. And they also create this sort of like, um, what's the word, like familiar kind of way of speaking, you know, a vernacular thing where it's sort of like, oh yeah, I know, I understand. Like people have certain like verbal tics which they go back to and they repeat and like heaven knows I do a fair share of mine on this channel as well. Um, but it's a, uh, it, it really works in this. And also sometimes the words themselves do actually represent something. Like the fact that he keeps repeating, I know, I understand, um, it makes him sound like someone who has to keep, you know, justifying his own sanity to us. He's like, yeah, I do, I understand things, right? I know what's going on. I'm not, you know, I'm not mad, I'm not mad. So that, that obviously creates this, this sense of uncertainty on our part. And also like, you know, characterizes him alpha as someone who's sort of like clinging on to the few things that actually make sense to him in the world and then the other one god's truth which gets repeated all the way through like almost on like every page right um that feels like you know like i said there's the vernacular kind of familiar thing also for me it feels like it has this uh working class and religious identity attached to it um, which again characterizes the guy alpha more and then the words god's truth right like literally invoke this sort of objective benign uh, reality which um, obviously is completely at odds with what's going on in this book if at this book there's all these identities and they're sort of slipping away or he's rather he's slipping away from them um, and falling away from sort of objective truths and things like that much less like benign or religious ones and yeah also someone who keeps saying like god's truth it sounds like he's trying to convince us of something right like um like with the i know i understand it always sounds like he's you know, even though his language says that he's sure of himself, everything about these little repetitions make us doubt that. That that also reminded me of uh, like the Telltale Heart and Edgar Allan Poe, you know, like the crazy person who's saying like, but look, I'm not crazy and I'm going to tell you why I'm not crazy. Um, and then there's the horror, like there's the, like, it's, it's very violent, but I think it, the violence is done in a, in a really like kind of clever way. Like it, it doesn't feel, it never feels like over the top, you know, given that it's 
describing World War One, which is horrific. You know, it's not supposed. It's supposed to be, you know, like attacking the glorification of war and stuff like that, right? It's it makes sense the the real nasty gore that happens in this. Um, and yeah, I'm not a fan really of, of gory books, but like this was done perfectly. There's also like surprising humor in it though. Like it's not, I, I didn't feel like it's kind of this really depressing kind of like thing, even though it's oppressive, it's also got a kind of playfulness at times, um, with the language, which is like just kind of fun. Like, um, there's this thing with the severed hands, um, which I don't know, maybe this is just me, but I found that it was quite like grotesque in a, in a funny way. Uh, in a few parts and not in a way that broke with the atmosphere like to use like a filmic comparison i'm not talking about adam's family severed hand humor i'm talking about evil dead 2 severed hand humor it's like still horrible all the way through but there's something about it which is absurd which which you can kind of laugh at i think at, at, at times at times really hope that's not just me let me give you like a little passage to give you a sense of like the writing here because it's this it's this prose it's the rhythm of it which is really what makes it stand out Temporary madness makes it possible to forget the truth about bullets. Temporary madness in war is bravery's sister. But when you seem crazy all the time, continuously, without stopping, that's when you make people afraid, even your war brothers. And that's when you stop being the brave one, the death defier, and become instead the true friend of death, its accomplice, its more than brother. So, like, wow, let's do a little close reading here. Those first two lines, right? Temporary madness makes it possible to forget the truth about bullets. Temporary madness in war is bravery's sister. Like, that is just brilliant phrasing to create that sort of repetitive muttering kind of energy, you know what I mean? For example, he could have put it another way. He could have put, in war, temporary madness is bravery's sister. And that makes it sound a bit more aphoristic, you know what I mean? Like you're reading someone's essay or something like that. It sounds a bit more, like, clever. Um, whereas this one, you know, the temporary madness, blah, 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 temporary madness in war is bravery sister. It sounds, you know, kind of more conversational and more like it's got this, this, this rhythm of the structure repeating and repeating and then changing through repetitions that is just more like it gets this relentless feeling across. Like chanting, right? Like, like someone chanting. And the fact that that, that that clever line, you know, like temporary madness in war is bravery sister, um, the reason it, it works is because it's connected to the line that came before it rhythmically. So I feel like that is what is like emblematic about this, this whole novel that if you take out like one sort of interesting sentence, it, it loses its power instantly because it's connected to all the stuff, the way that it's structured. Um, it would be, it's like taking water out of a stream, you know what I mean? You lose the character if you don't connect things in, 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 in large groups of sentences, which is really impressive, I think. There's also like this gendered ranking, I think, in that little section where it begins by talking about bravery. He says, you know, madness in war is bravery's sister. Uh, but when you seem crazy all the time, that's when you make people afraid, even your war brothers. Um, and then you stop being the brave one, you become death's accomplice, it's more than brother. So we go like sister, and then we go like brother, and then we go like more than brother. And I think that like kind of escalation, um, using gender to create this escalation, uh, fits the character because it's it's a kind of misogynistic thing, right? Like, And, and he has lots of like um, metaphors which are quite sexist about like kind of... Um, or at least very kind of, you know, objectifying of women. There's this thing about the trench that they come out of being like a giant vagina and that he's like kind of going in and out of the vagina every day when he's going out into the no man's land and then back into the into the trench. And it's got like this sort of birthing imagery, like he's coming out of the like the muddy womb stuff. Um, but yeah, that's like kind of like didn't sit well with me at all um, because, uh, like I said, it's got a very, you know, 21st century sensibility towards identity and race and colonialism and masculinity and stuff but the stuff when it came to like those misogynistic bits like I kind of felt they weren't really like kind of examined or critiqued in the way that the other stuff is like um like I couldn't really just say oh it's just a character you know what I mean even if it is a realistic way that someone might feel at that time um it felt too underdeveloped or explored to uh to warrant being included um, at least at the, the beginning of the book. And then at the end, well, I'll get to the end at the end. Before I talk about any of that, I want to talk about the Achilles thing, right? Um, and I know, like, you're probably thinking, Seb, come on, not everything is a Greek myth retelling. Can you just let a book be itself? 
This is a Greek myth retelling, I swear it is. I've only seen one other person mention the Achilles connection and that was kind of like, oh yeah, it kind of gave me some Achilles vibes or whatever. But no, it's really, it's really in there. It's like, you have to believe me on this, like God's truth, <laughs> it's properly in there. Um, the thing is that like Achilles is a soldier and he has a more than brother Patroclus who is either a lover or a sort of like incredibly passionate soulmate type of best friend depending on how, how you want to come at it but definitely a more than brother kind of figure. Um, Patroclus is killed and Achilles who before didn't want to fight now um, becomes incredibly angry and start and he goes onto the, the battlefield and he just starts like slaughtering people and like mutilating their bodies and through this this rage and kind of uh, vengeful anger against the enemy Trojans he Achilles comes up with this kind of enlightenment he he starts to see that like he starts to see what he thinks is the truth about war and that like well we're all going to die anyways and this is totally pointless and yet the fact that he's thinking that he sees as justification for doing these really gruesome acts like um, for example, this guy like Aeon comes up to him and is begging him, you know, like, please spare my life. And he has absolutely no reason to kill like Aeon. And he used to not kill Trojans. He used to capture them and send them off to be slaves. Um, but he kind of, he talks to like Aeon and he says, like, you know, why are you, why are you begging for your life? You're going to, we're all going to die. I'm going to die. Everyone's going to die. This war is going to destroy everything. So you might as well just accept it, you know, just accept that I'm going to kill you because this is what the gods want. Um, so, you know, you might as well just be brave and, and, and let me kill you. And then he kills him and then he throws his body in the river and then like starts vaunting over him and being like really mean about it. Like the fish are going to eat you. He starts like, I remember he starts like talking about how the fish are going to eat him. That really stuck in my mind. But yeah, like this book as well, um, you know, his more than brother dies. He then, more than brother is just like such a good term. Like it's so important. I think this idea of, of like this homosocial bond between two men which is not necessarily homosexual, but is definitely like supposed to transcend the, the bonds of what society permits uh, normally to exist between two uh, people of the same sex. It's an it's a interesting concept. And, and I do feel like that also fits very well with the ancient Greek side of things. But yeah, to go back to Achilles, he definitely, uh, I mean, like Alpha definitely has this kind of enlightenment moment. Like when he's killing these young soldiers on the German side, he says like at different times that this is what, what God wants and this is like fate has decided that I would meet this soldier and I would do this to this soldier. So he also has this kind of like this sense that he's above everyone now because he can see the truth about war and that gives him permission to do these incredibly grotesque things in his rage and in his violence. Um, and, and, and the thing about the Iliad, like with Achilles, is that one of the main tensions after he's gone on his big bloodlust rampage kind of thing and he's gotten uh, Hector and mutilated the body horribly in front of everybody and even his own side, the Greeks are thinking like, whoa, what's up with Achilles? This is a little bit too far, just like the uh, the French think of um, Alpha in this book. But but yeah, once that's happened, we're kind of thinking, what happens now for Achilles? Can he go back to being a normal human? Can he kind of like recover from this, this thing? Can he regain some of his humanity? Um, and and that's that's the question that gets answered at the end of, of that poem and in this book as well like the ending isn't the same but I feel like that's kind of a question that that like appears at the end like at the beginning he's just like crazy like in the first part yeah let's talk about the structure so it's, it's basically I, I feel like it's in three parts there's the first part which is in the trenches and uh, it's all like kind of madness and he's going and he's getting the hands and gradually people are starting to to think that there's something completely messed up about that rather than heroic, um, but he keeps doing it anyways. It's not so gradual to be honest. I think he says it's specifically between like the fourth and fifth hand or the third and fourth hand or something that suddenly everybody is like, oh, and I like that. I like that that there's a number to it. It reminds me of one of my favorite passages in literature, which is in a Julio Cortázar story, um, which I've talked about on this channel before, but it's about a guy who vomits up rabbits and like he says, I can just about manage the fact that I've been vomiting up rabbits because I can keep them in the house and it's fine. But then between like the like the 11th rabbit and the 12th rabbit or something like that, he's like, that's it. I've lost control. It's like the number. Once you get past, you know, if 11, everything's fine. But once you get to the 12, then oh no, my life is ruined. There's rabbits everywhere. Um, but yeah, uh, like that reminded me of this a lot with the number, the arbitrary number of hands where everyone suddenly went, oh, okay, actually this isn't all right at all. God, I get so distracted. Um, so in the, in about halfway through, I think the first part kind of ends because something happens which necessarily changes the pace and the tone 
um, and that action. It's not jarring, it's quite seamless the way we move into a different part where we start becoming more reflective and uh, we get a lot of flashbacks um, to what life was like for uh, Alpha and Mademba, which is the name of his more than brother, um, before the war uh, when they were still in West Africa and they were still like like kind of like how they how they grew up and their life there and the the, the tone also feels a little bit more like um, like you're reading uh, sort of like a folk tale um, without completely changing again like it's it's melded together quite well but because of that like reflective thing of going back to recollections and so on um, yeah the pace obviously has to slow down and change and like just kind of be a bit more relaxed and um, honestly, like, it didn't work for me so well because I just felt like, you know, the energy dropped, you know, and like I was so into the energy at the beginning. Um, and I saw someone else's review of this where they said they really liked the break, you know, because it was like it was so frenzied at the beginning that, you know, it's like you get a little bit of fresh air. And um, but yeah, I don't know. I like the frenzy. Like it's still really interesting and well written all the way through. And it's like, like I said, like very intentionally, uh, like seamless between those different parts. But um, I, I just really like the intensity of the first bit. And I think if you have, if you begin your book and the first half of your book is incredibly intense and then you lose that for whatever, like intentional reason at the end, it's just like, it's, it, it, it doesn't feel, it, it's hard to stick the landing, right? And like I said, it's very smoothly done. Like um, there's these things about masculinity and about trauma and about uh, colonialism, which are all the way present in the first bit of the novel. And then we get like another way of looking at them um, when we're having the, you know, the childhood and the sort of maturing years of, of Alpha and Madembe. Um, and and like there's this this thing to do with capitalism, which was incredibly interesting. Where there's this one chapter where they talk about um, the uh, uh, the this peanut crop, how the French are getting the the villagers in Alpha's community to try and um, like only grow one crop because then they can export it and then they can make more money that way. And so there's this link between capitalism and colonialism, and there's this resistance to it from. I think it's Alpha's father or his grandfather um, because they say, yeah, but that would kind of destroy our way of life because then we're only, you know, we exist only for one crop. Whereas at the moment we've got lots of crops and, you know, if one fails, we have other things. And so it's sort of like, it's this um, kind of insidious type of colonialism, um, which is very much tied to capitalism. And that's such a really interesting idea and place of exploration. And I'm so glad that it, it got explored a little bit, but the way that it came in in that recollection part, I just felt that it was... I don't know. Again, it didn't have the intensity. It didn't gel uh, like with the stuff that had come before. The explorations of colonialism at the beginning of the book were so compelling so that I just didn't care when we got these other kind of like snippets towards the end. Um, it just felt like it, 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 it could have been done better, you know, or just maybe it should have been omitted entirely and then done as a separate project. I guess what I'm saying is I feel the three parts of this book don't really go together. They're not tight enough for me personally, um, which is a shame because the first part is so, so, so good. Um, and, uh, and, and, it's, and I think, like I said, it's the first half of the book is, is like that. The third part, especially, um, well, basically what happens in the third, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to spoil it, but I will say that a lot of the objectification, the thing I didn't like about the first part was this objectification of women and this sort of unchallenged misogyny. Uh, which exists not a lot, but just a little bit, and enough to make you go, mm, mm, did you, mm, really? Do you need that there? Um, but then in the third part of the book, that kind of has, that comes to fruition and it makes sense. And you're like, oh, okay, those things were like planting seeds for what was going to come later when we do properly connect masculinity to all this war, morality, colonialism stuff. And we, we get to the misogyny of the character and see how it's expressed through his his experiences in in world war one and it just i don't know it gave me that feeling that kind of like very analytical feeling you know of sort of like oh that's why we were doing that thing okay i get it which is not how you want to feel at the end of a book right it's like obviously masculinity has been critiqued uh, throughout the book but specifically in this area of the objectification of women it hasn't been and that wasn't sitting well with me and then at the very end it is it's kind of brought to the front it's like kind of yeah we're this is how we're going to do it um and it just was like too little too late it could have been handled better basically so even though it's so short i almost would have wanted the book to be shorter um as in like if it or or if it was just like if it was all like the first part the trench warfare part but without the sexism or if it was maybe a bit longer but everything was done in a way which like kind of cohesively 
brought things together. Um, like, it, it, no, basically, if the ending could maintain the energy from the beginning, if we could have that kind of thrilling energy go all the way through, um, then I would have liked it better. And maybe that's just a personal taste, because I know lots of people have loved this book, and like I said, they enjoyed the the fact that the ending is more chill than the beginning. Um, also about the ending, um, like, again, I'm not going to go into a spoiler, but uh, I will say that I feel that, like, as someone who's watched a lot of horror films, there's a certain type of ending that I'm used to, and when it, it it's in this book, and so it just felt like, oh, okay, it's one of those, right? Because like some stuff happens, I, I've, I've seen like a lot of people are confused about the ending on the internet, um, and some stuff happens, and it's like quite jarring, and for a moment, you're like what's going on, and then they explain it, and you're like, oh. Okay, that's what happened. Um, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's just like me being narrow-minded or something, but to me it felt very, um, very cliche compared to what had come before. Um, and I, I just, I thought it was a very weak ending, uh, which is such a shame um, because like I said, the writing is good all the way through. And speaking of cliche, one of the absolutely amazing things about this that I only realized really when I finished it is that it follows a lot of World War One tropes. Right, like when you, when at least when I think of World War One from like popular media and stuff, I've got this strong image of uh, like the, the the trench warfare, the brothers in arms, the sort of you know they have to go over and then they get shot to bits and the barbed wire and they have to crawl in the mud to get back. Um, and um, what else? There's a best friend who is like the reason to live and to keep on going, and then the best friend gets killed. So it's like, so what's the point anymore? There's a girl who's waiting back at home. There's this um, baptism of fire kind of scene um well not really a scene but like it happens where there's these young guys who are naive and they want to like you know like kind of prove themselves and go out into the world and they think that war has got some glory to it and they go and they find it's actually lots of blood and mud and, and it's pretty horrible there's even like the pretty nurse like i think that's like a trope in world war one stuff like and again again like i don't even know this from like cartoons and stuff like that you know so like uh, TV stuff like I, I've not read I think ever a World War One book but for me like basically most of the World War One tropes that I know were here in this book and yet it ne I never noticed it I never when I was reading it I never felt the cliche of that World War One stuff and again maybe it's just because I don't know so much about World War One so maybe if you're like a World War One fan then this would be kind of like you know going over the the, the same the same beats that you're used to but I thought it was amazing that it managed to do all that stuff that was kind of familiar to me, but feel so fresh, feel so new. Obviously part of that, like a big part of that is the fact that it's from a black perspective. It's from uh, a colonized person of color um, going through these tropes rather than the normal white guys. So like, it's not, I think it's important that it's not just like representation for representation's sake. It's not just like doing all the sort of normal tropes and having a black person do go through them, which, you know, has its own value, obviously. it is. It is valuable to tell these stories again, but like include the people who've been uh, historically excluded from them, right? That like that serves like a social function, um, which is really important to get these, these stories out there. Um, and that's like, yeah, like that's commendable in and of itself. But um, it can also just seem like tokenism, you know, it can seem really cheap. It can seem like, yeah, well, we've heard this story a million times. You're just like putting in a woman or a queer person or a black person, you know what I mean? Um, and this like, really to its credit doesn't do that at all it feels so like fresh it feels so like you know it's bringing you know like all these old tropes about world war one back to life and like you know like making them feel fresh and horrible in a totally new way by introducing these elements of race um, and colonialism which are not usually included uh, i think in the world war one uh, story that is told. So that was uh, like a really huge triumph of this book that I feel I can't stress enough. So yeah, to conclude, um, the style, the atmosphere, the kind of like the, the rhythmic uh, repetitions and like the sort of the dread of this book is amazing. The way it kind of like uh, resuscitates or like brings to life World War I um, by uh, like, you know, not telling the same old stories, but like using the, the tropes of those same old stories, but like kind of, um, you know, uh, reinvigorating, the, reinvigorating them with like new, well, contemporary ideas about race and colonialism and, and basically familiar and unfamiliar stuff in, in form and content uh, is mixed really perfectly. Like it gets the perfect balance and I thought that was brilliant. When it comes to the structure though, and the pacing and the ending, I do have problems with it, which is a real shame because the other stuff is so strong. Um, oh, and the, you know, the, the misogyny stuff, like I feel like it doesn't quite work 
in the way that the other stuff like to do with race and colonialism does. But yeah, overall, I would definitely recommend it. Um, definitely a great experience for two euros. I'm, I'm so glad I read it. And uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to more stuff by David Diop. I hope he gets more books out, more translations out. Um, oh, the translation, I didn't talk about that. The title is like Frère Dame, like Soul Brothers in French. Uh, oh, I didn't even say it. it's translated by Anna Moscho, Moschavakis. Anna Moschavakis. So well done, Anna Moschavakis. It's an incredible translation. Um, but yeah, the, the title Frère Dame is like Soul Brother. And yeah, uh, I think it, it's so much better in terms of like linking or soul brothers maybe i forget um but it's does such a good job of linking everything together under one like concept uh where a night of blood is black from a marketing point of view it's definitely snap snappier in english like i would definitely be more interested to, to buy a book with this title than one which is called soul brothers it's like what's that about um but uh, but yeah, I don't think this title is so good in terms of like, like from a literature point of view, like how it encapsulates what's going on. Like it, it basically doesn't. It's just, it's a line taken from the novel, which in the novel works really well. Because like I said, it's like, it's the, the little piece of the larger st stream. It like, it kind of links together lots of uh, images and ideas. And it's got like this sort of profound meaning. But when you take it away and you just slap it on the cover, uh, it, it doesn't reflect the book, I think, uh, very well, like what the book is trying to get across. At night, all blood is black. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I just, mm, well, anyway, like I said, it, it's just kind of functional. Okay, I think that is all I'm going to say about that book. Um, it's been a while since I did a big rambly review like this. I do really recommend At Night All Blood is Black, even though I have my issues with it. Um, if it hadn't been for those structural pacing things, then this could have been like, you know, an absolute favorite of 2021. Um, unfortunately, it just fell short. But yeah, let me know uh, in the comments if you've read it, if you liked it, if you loved it, if you agree with me, that is actually the story of Achilles and Patroclus, um, or if you totally disagree with me and you think that I'm just a Greek myth nut. Uh, do let me know, and I'll uh, catch you in the next video. Night.